The music has been wonderful. And I've sure enjoyed it. How many of you are thankful for music that is clearly Christ-honoring? And boy, let's, yeah, let's thank all these musicians and singers again. Well done. Well done. And I have thoroughly enjoyed Brother Vaughn every morning. Uh, he throws those nuggets out there so fast. Uh, you have to be careful to catch them all. But I'm telling you, that's amazing. Um, in the time that I can't get an introduction out, he's over and done. And, and he just makes it happen. Oh, my. And God has given that man a gift, and his passion for prayer has touched our life. It's touched our ministry's life. And I pray that today it's touching your life. Boy, last night's message from Dr. John Getch, this magnificent servant. Um, how many of you liked his football story last <laughs> night? How many of you are on the playing field with him getting thumped at 63 to nothing at halftime, right? Wow. I played in some football games I thought were a little lopsided. I feel wonderful today. I mean... <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of John, chapter 16. The book of John, chapter 16. We're living in a, a day when everybody wants your ear. Do you understand, to get into you, God created with you with two ports of entry. One is your eyes, and one is your ears. Anybody who wants to influence you says, hey, look here, look here. Hey, listen to this, listen to this. Because that's how you get in. Who you give your eyes to and who you give your ears to, their influence is in. I promise you in this conference, we're doing everything in our power, Brother Vaughn's doing everything in his power to capture your eyes and your ears. Because that's how you get in. And who you give your eyes and ears to is who you're saying fashioned my life. I grew up on farms, a little different than the dairy farms that Dr. Getch was on. I grew up on cattle feedlot farms. We were in the cattle slaughtering business. And my family slaughtered five to 7,000 head of cattle a week. And I grew up on feedlots where semis were coming and going. Our farms were never pretty. Uh, they were farm farms. But one day I bought a small farm for myself and I got some cattle and uh, I got a great buy on the farm because it was all overgrown, it had been let go. Uh, all the weeds, all the weeds on my farm were shoulder high, some of them were 10 feet high. But I got a great buy because I wasn't sure what I bought. <laughs> so I called my dad and I said, I, I need to borrow your brush hog and get out here and and clean this up, see what I own. And I like brush hogs. How many of you ever had a brush hog time? Yeah, I mean, they're just fun. Uh, nothing's pretty, but it's all down, okay? And you go over it, and man, if the tractor can bend it over, it'll chop it up for you. Well, I'm out mowing along, and everything's going good, and I made a discovery that I bought something on my farm I did not know was there. Now, I found a lot of things. Uh, Somebody had thrown away dozens of old baby buggies. You ought to hear what they sound like going through a brush hog. <laughs> it's great. And then somebody threw away some old engine blocks. You ought to hear what they sound like going through a brush hog. Wow. But I'm mowing along, and I went over a hole, not very big, but that big around. And in that hole was an animal I had no idea existed on planet Earth. They're called ground bees. They're a cousin of a wasp. And when I went over that hole, those ground bees, like an oil gusher, came flying up out of that hole. They came after that tractor, and they came after that brush hog like you couldn't imagine. They're trying to sting it. Some of them went into the tires and stuck so hard they got stuck on the tires of the tractor. But while they were nailing the tractor and while they were nailing the brush hog, you could hear them talking. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I'm telling you, they did. They said, get the fat boy on the tractor. <laughs> That's what they said. They went up my pant legs. They went down the back of my T-shirt. They went up under my ball cap. I got bit everywhere. Those stingers are unreal. I come flying off that tractor, swatting myself. I didn't even get the thing out of gear. <laughs> it just ran off and went and hit a tree and stopped over there. Man, I went and jumped under. There's a pond, probably a distance from here to that wall. Man, I jumped in that pond, and I'm looking up. You can see them hitting the water. <sighs> Finally, they went away. I come out of that pond, and I had one mission in life get even with the ground bees. <laughs> I know vengeance belongs to the Lord, but on occasion he just has to understand. That's all. I mean, it's just... I told my wife, she said, you're so lucky you didn't get killed. I said, I'm telling you, I'm going to get even. She said, don't you think we should call some people out here who know what they're doing? How many of you men understand the inherent insult in that comment, right? <laughs> now, if you're in the country and you want to do something, there is a resident place of knowledge called the feed store. And in the country, you go to the feed store, and there are always guys sitting in the feed store who can answer just about everything. Man, I am all bit to pieces. I come walking in the feed store. They got a pot belly stove there, and there's three guys sitting there, and when they looked up, it was amazing. First guy looked at me, and he said, ground bees. <laughs> I thought the man's a prophet. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Second guy looked at me, and he said, bet that hurt. And third guy said, bet you want to know how to get even. <laughs> I mean, it was ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. I hadn't even opened my mouth yet. I said, yeah, you bet. I want to know how to get even. I said, okay, here's what you do. Make sure you wait till tonight. Because they said at dusk, like ribbons in the sky, they'll all come back and go down the hole. You get them all in the hole. You don't wait till it's dark, they'll nail you again. And you don't want that, do you, fat boy? I said, no. <laughs> fat boy don't want that. No, no, no. They said, once they're all down the hole, you pour gas down the hole. And once you've poured gas down the hole, then you light a match, and you will feel much better. <laughs> I said, I got it. Wait till dark, gas down the hole, light a match. They said, that's it. Then I went home. I told my wife, this is going to be good. <laughs> sure enough, I waited. And at dusk, it was amazing. Like ribbons in the sky, black ribbons. I have no idea how many ground bees were in that hole, but thousands and thousands of them. And they would come and go whoosh, right down the hole. Finally, it's all dark. I got my son Matthew, who's a pastor today, with me. He was a young man, and we went out and we're listening. And, man, you can hear him down there. I think they're still gurgling on the fat boy stuff. <laughs> so point one's done. Dark, they're in the hole. Point number two, I need gas. Walked over. Got a five-gallon can with me. <laughs> Poured five gallons down the hole. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of bees. <laughs> but I'm not done. I can still hear them. <laughs> so I pour a second five-gallon can. <laughs> They never said how much gas to pour down the hole. <laughs> I told Matt, I said, there's a bunch. 
Go get the other two five-gallon cans. <laughs> when it was done, I had 20 gallons of gas down the hole. I said, okay, Matt, I'm ready to feel good. <laughs> what happened next was like unbelievable. I took the match and I went, and I never got to toss it. <laughs> I mean, I went. <laughs> I burned a perfect circle. All those vapors had come up out of that hole and spread out in a circle. That circle had to be probably 75 or more feet in diameter. It melted the soles on my shoes. It took my eyebrows off. Flames went up so high in the air that we got a call from the local police that an airliner had spotted an explosion. My wife, who was watching from the house, came running out. And she said, where's Matthew? You killed Matthew. And I'm looking around, no Matt. He had run and jumped in the pond. <laughs> Next morning, I went back to the feed store. All three of them are sitting there. First one said, too much gas. Second one said, bet that hurt. And third one said, bet you're up here to find out how to do it next time. I said, guys, I got one question. How many times... Have you ever done it? You know what they said in unison? We've never done it. We just tell other people how to do it. And the one guy said, fools like you walk in here all day long. You know what I've discovered? Everybody wants to tell you how to do it but they've never done it. And what they want is for you to follow their counsel, their advice. But they're not following their counsel. And they're not following their advice. You remember what Paul said, the things you have heard and seen in me do. We're about to read a passage of scripture that has a command and a promise of God in it. And the command is one that it's kind of impossible to understand why anyone would want to navigate life without it. Because it's a command of well-being, it's a command of joy, it's a command of peace. But then God tells you how to produce that command. The passage we're about to read is at the end of what people often refer to as the upper room discourse. And Jesus has just told his disciples all the horrific things that are going to befall him. And they're upset, they're dismayed. This is not a good moment for them. Most of them had mistakenly thought that Jesus Christ was here to usher in the kingdom, physically and humanly. But he said, no, my kingdom's not of this world. 
And now they're suddenly being told once again that he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be beaten, he's going to be crucified for the sins of the world. And in the midst of that, he gives them this command. Get ready to read with me John chapter 16, starting at verse 31. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things, these dismaying, troublesome things, I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. Now he makes a pronouncement, in the world you shall have tribulation. But here's the command, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <laughs> Repetitively, from the mouths of Jesus, he commanded, be of good cheer. In the midst of a hellacious scorn, storm on the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus came walking on the water, the disciples fearful that they're going to die. Jesus walking on the water so frightened them that they screamed with fear. And you know what he says? Be of good cheer. Do you realize be of good cheer is not a suggestion. It is a command to every child of God. Be of good cheer means that there is a resident peace. It means there is a resident joy. There is something magnificently happy. Be of good cheer. Is that you? Is that me? It's an amazing thing to be around people who don't have cheer. They drain you. Just being in their presence sucks the hope out of you. They're like little walking hoovers. They want to vacuum you. And if there's any joy, any peace, if there's any cheer in you, they want to remove it because they don't have it. Do you want people to be wanting to be around you? Be a man of good cheer. Remember, it's not a suggestion, it is a command. Now the world says, yeah, yeah, this is all right. We want you to be happy, we want you to be cheerful. But the world says there's three ways you get it. And I want you to write these three down because they're all deceptively wrong. The only place you can get cheer is from Jesus Christ. Number one, the world says you want cheer, here's how you do it. By diversion. By diversion. You just got to get something to get your mind off of things. Man, you need a vacation. You need to go play golf. You need to go hunting. You need to go fishing. You need to get a hobby. You just need something that's a diversion. And boy, they've made a masterful art of marketing diversion. And it always shows these people happy. Now, two problems with diversion. The problems you left will still be there when you get back. The stuff that's been tearing you up will still be there. All you'll have done is diverted for a moment. The second problem is most diversions are pretty expensive. Boy, let's buy a boat. Yeah. You know how to make a small fortune? Start with a large one and buy a boat. Man, it'll cost you a fortune. And all of a sudden, we're living in a world that's diversion crazy. The problem is you just haven't gotten away. The problem is you, and God never said, I'm going to give you good cheer, but you're going to have to get away to find it. You see, are you against going to get some rest? No, Jesus went to get rest. 
but diversion's not the answer to cheer. It's okay if you can't do it that way. What you want to do is by numbing yourself. And boy, the two chief things are drugs and alcohol. Let's just get something that numbs you up. I'll never forget I was in the hospital and was in a lot, a lot of pain, didn't understand I was having a gallbladder attack. And I walked in that hospital, I said, man, I, I need a doctor. Oh, I need a doctor. And this lady came walking in and she said, uh, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I said, no, 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 I need a real doctor. <laughs> I need a man. She said, well, let me explain to you. She said, I got something here in this needle that'll take all your pain away, or you can wait for a real doctor. <laughs> I said, Doc, you're looking more beautiful all the time. Come on, come on. You know what? If you don't have Jesus Christ, you're going to look for something to numb it up. And I'm a little frightened because drugs and alcohol are invading Christian homes. Magnetized by what's on television has become the prime diversion. People have no time to read the Bible, no time to pray, but they can put in hours every day in front of electronic media and computers. That's all diversion. And then something to numb it up. In order to keep all our bar permissions and bar licenses, I have to take a lot of continuing legal education every year. And part of it is on substance abuse. And every time I go, it amazes me. They all stand up and they say, now look, we know you're gonna use drugs, we know you're gonna use alcohol because everybody loves the buzz. And one time I raised my hand and I said, wouldn't it just be best if we didn't do the drug and alcohol? And every head in the place spun around and looked at me like, what planet did he fall off of? We're living in a culture that is drug and alcohol. It's numbing obsessed. Obsessed. Well, the world says if you can't do it with diversion and if you can't do it with numbing, then here's the third thing you do. You just decide, I'm going to resign myself. That's just the way life is. And our churches are full of men who've ever given up on good cheer. This is just the way life is. And I guess you just have to take it the way it is. If you only hear one thing this morning, no, you don't have to take it the way it is. The Bible commands be of good cheer. If I could talk to your kids before you could talk to them, would your kids say, there's nobody more cheerful on planet Earth than Dad? Grandpa, oh my soul, the most cheerful person on the planet. Or would you have to say, yeah, I'd like that to be the case. Remember what I said? Why would anybody want to navigate life without this? When by God's grace we can be this. Now please note what he says. Look at the verses we just read once again. Verse 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Now here's the pronouncement. In the world... You shall have tribulation. Underline the word tribulation in your Bible. Um, the people to whom he was speaking would understand this explicitly. In that day when they threshed wheat or grain, rice, anything, they had to get the chaff separated from the valuable grain. Today we have combines that do all of that in one step. But in that day they would spread all of the grain out 
And they did it manually, and the way they did it was they had a long wooden club, looked like an overgrown baseball bat, and it had a spike, like a big nail, in the end of it. And they would take that club with that spike, and they'd whack the fire out of that grain. Whack, whack, whack. That club was called a tribulum. And the process of whacking it was called tribulation. Do you know what God says? In this world, you shall have what? Tribulation. Brother Vaughn said it so clear. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Jesus said in this world, there's going to be stuff that's going to try to knock the fire out of you. I don't know what's on your plate right now. All I know is tribulation. And God said, it's going to come. But he said, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Now, in this passage, he tells us how to get this cheer. And I want you to write this down. Because why would you want to go home without it? Why would you want to live a day without good cheer? Oh, my, my. You know, there's people I know, Christians, they're not nice to be around. Boy, the look on their face. Remember, your face is God's billboard. It's always talking. I think people forget if you've never been on a platform, while you're watching the platform, Whoever's on the platform's watching your faces. Boy, your faces talk. There's some people I'd never want to take a car ride with them of any length. That'd be tribulation. But God said, I want you to be the person of good cheer. Now write this point down. Here's number one. Here's how God gives good cheer. We're going to read it in just a minute. It's in the passage. God says, I'm not going to give it to you by substitution. I'm going to give it to you by transformation. I'm not going to give it to you by substitution. I'm going to give it to you by transformation. I am going to transform you through your tribulations. Not going to make them go away. Not going to subs- you, you know how we get little kids happy? They're toy broke. Here, take this one. Here, take this one. We try to give them something else that'll make them happy. Man, if you've ever been in the nursery, one kid grabs a toy from the other one. This kid is screaming, he took my toy. Here, take this one. Take this one. That's how we come to God. Just give me something to make me happy. God said, that's not how I'm going to do it. I am literally going to take your trials and transform you into a person of good cheer. Read with me the passage, starting at verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be, what's the next word? Turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. 
And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Whoa. God doesn't make great Christians on mountaintops. He makes them in the valley. Great soldiers are not made on R&R. &R. Great soldiers are made on the battlefield. If you've ever climbed on a commercial airliner, if the pilot came on and said, kind of knew at this and just want you to know I've never been in any bad weather. <laughs> so what will be a first for you will be a first for me. Have a great flight. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You want a pilot that's been there a lot of times, who has the judgment, the skill set. You see, his skills are never honed in smooth weather. His skills are honed in the storm. Yes, amen. The Lord said, I want to transform you. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When's the last time, with all thanks, you said, Lord, thanks for this. You want good cheer? That's where it starts. Because you're going to use this to make me what I'm supposed to be. Not by substitution, not by, and boy, if I ever prayed this wrong so long, God, just make this go away. How many of y'all have ever prayed like that? God, just make it go away. Oh. All right, God, enough. I got it. Make it go away. When's the last time you said, don't make this go away until I'm what you want me to be? That's how you get good cheer. It's not by substitution. It's by transformation. Write the second thing down. We want to be the men of good cheer. We're not going to do it through diversion. We're not going to do it through numbing. And we're not going to do it by resignation. We're going to do it by understanding that God's in control of these trials. And whatever it is that's whacking on us, God has brought that. Number one, it's not by substitution, it's by transformation. Write number two down. Prayer is the key to the transformation. Prayer. Start with me in verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever she shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hereunto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive. Say out loud the next phrase with me, that your joy may be full. Lord, I want to be transformed. And God, asking prayer. Yesterday, when I spoke about what's on your prayer list, that word ask there is the word for asking with specificity. Not asking in general. Ask and ye shall receive. The Bible says ye have not because you ask not. The word specificity again. My wife has helped me so much. She'll say, let's get real specific with God. 
what exactly are we asking for? Now, I'm, I'm kind of like, I ain't got time for this, honey. Let's just give it a prayer shot and get on. And God says, uh-uh. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. How good are you at getting specific with the ask? I was in a trial. It was not going well. In fact, it was going horrible. And about the third day, you know you're in trouble when the jury looks at you, and every time they look, they either look down or they go. And it just makes for a very long day in court. Halfway through it, one of the deacons in the church came up to me and he said, boy, I thought you were a much better lawyer than this. And I'm like, oh, good night. What I didn't have the heart to tell him is I thought ahead of this I was too. I mean, this is just not going so great. But the pastor's wife came up and she said, oh, Brother Gibbs, Brother Gibbs. She said, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. I got ESP. And this is going great. I said, you got ESP? Oh, yeah. And I said to her, you, you got extra sensory perception? She said, no, no. ESP, enough sense to pray. <laughs> and with that, she opened like, a thing like a shopping bag she's carrying. And she said, here's what I've been praying for in this trial. It had to be 30 pages. And she said, if all we got is you, Brother Gibbs, then all we got is a man. But we got God prowling these rooms. When she said that, my face lit up. I thought, you know what, Judge? You've been giving me trouble for three days. Unless my God gives you your next breath, you're a dead man. <laughs> that jury, my God's in control of not only what they do, what they think, and what they say. How many of you are thankful your God is in control? In this world, ye shall have. But have you got ESP? enough sense to pray. I was in a room with some wonderful pastors. I would dare say half the men in that room, you'd know their name. Men of national and international renown. Man, we were wrestling with the problem and one of the men said, you know, we've been working on this now for six hours and do you think maybe we ought to pray? And the man sitting next to me said, in jest, you mean it's come to that? I want you to hear me and I'm done. The devil loves it. Let's see if you can figure it out. Or have you got ESP? Enough sense to say, I'm going to have this. Sometimes it's little things, sometimes it's unspeakably huge things, but every child of God is going to have it. And would you, would I, ask with specificity? At the end of that trial I told you about, we won. The judge literally in court, when the jury announced the verdict, he said, I don't know how this happened. I turned around and looked at that pastor's wife and she went. <laughs> Do you know what happens to most people? We go through the valley. And all we do is come out bewildered. Never understanding we are commanded by God 
to be the people of good cheer. I'm at a church, we're going to have visitation, and a young lady in the church came in. She's a thalidomide baby. A drug which was thought to be safe, which was FDA approved, got out, and lo and behold, too late, they found out that it did unbelievable deformity and birth defects. This young lady, born with no legs, no arms, just a trunk of a body. Strapped in a wheelchair, can't even hold herself up, has to be strapped up. She's there for visitation. And I looked at her and I thought, how'd you like never to be able to scratch your face? comb your hair? How would you like to have to ask people to do? Preacher said, let's do just before we go out a few testimonies of praise. And she's sitting there and she went like this. And the preacher said, what's your testimony, Diane? And she said, I just want to thank the Lord for giving me such a good nose. She said, I need it so bad. I just want to praise him for it. The pastor sitting next to me said, let me explain, Brother Gibbs. When we'd go out so winning, we'd take her and put her by a Walmart or a grocery store, and her Bible is in the back of her chair. And people coming out, she just calls them over and says, could you come here a minute and just chat with me? And everybody comes. And then she says, would, would you get my Bible out? It's in a pouch behind me, and they get it out. And I ask them, would you hold it up? And Brother Gibbs, she uses her nose to turn the pages. Wow. I'm so glad I got a good nose. You know what magnetized me was her smile. But she had good cheer. If you don't have good cheer, it's because you chose. You chose to be the grump. You chose to be the Eeyore. How many of you know who Eeyore is? Winnie the Pooh's pal. You'll see, it'll get worse. <laughs> Stop it. You're commanded by the power of the God we serve to be a man of good cheer. I asked them to take me by where they put her. I thought, God, would that smile be on my face? I watched them hold Bible. I'm so thankful. I got a good nose. The Bible's the same for her and you and me and everything give thanks. But you know what the devil wants? To get you focused on the tribulation. You know what God says? I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Father, thank you. Why would we want to live without good cheer? You don't do it by substitution. You, 
do it by transformation that our joy may be full and God it's done by asking forgive me where I've been so focused on what's been knocking the fire out of me instead of saying my God's in control of this and if I ask I'd be the man of good cheer Heads are bowed. How many of you say, Brother Gibbs, God spoke to my heart this morning. I want to be a man of good cheer. If you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to step out and go to the aisle for one minute as far as you can. Remember, when we kneel, when we bow, it's not backs. It's not knees we bend. It's our spirit we bend. And we want to be the man. Ask that your joy may be full. You can send a new dad home, a new husband, a new friend. We can go home men of good cheer, not by our making but by the power of the God we serve. Father, I bow with these men. Forgive us. How did the devil ever stamp out our cheer when it's a promise from you and a command from you? God, tribulation's going to come, but you've overcome every bit of it. Praise the Lord. And by your grace, we're commanded to be men of good cheer. God, I ask for me right now. And I pray in the hearts of these men, you'd hear the cry of their precious hearts. May we be of good cheer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's men said, Amen. Amen. You make your way back to your seat. Thank you, Steve. May I mention these briefly, Brother Vaughn? David, you know, Charles Finney had a sermon on that. Did you know that? I did not. Remember when he was up in Northfield and did a, did a school commencement service? Yeah. That's when I first met you. Oh. And I told you to, you know, to get Charles Finney's book. I did not know. Remember that? Yeah, no. Thank you. <laughs> uh, maybe you're perfect at the stuff I just talked about. But I want to tell you what I've discovered. I want to be around men of good cheer. Amen. And I want to be a man of good cheer. Amen. There's nothing attractive about a Christian who doesn't have good cheer. And boy, you walk in some churches and you say, I think I'll look at the billboards, the faces. You can't hide good cheer. If it's there, your face will shine with it. And boy, I encourage you, while you're here at this moment of focused prayer, what a magnificent thing, how it's helping me make sure. Ask that your joy may be, what's the next word? Full. Uh, there's some books over here, and uh, every penny we make on ours, we do this. And I want to say this, if you're here with with limited, limited resources, make sure you buy Brother Vaughn's books first, please. Support this ministry. I'm going to go over there and get all the books he recommended. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bookaholic. I love books. And I want to tell you what I've discovered. If you get one good thing out of a book, it's worth a thousand times what you paid for it. And you make sure. Uh, over there, the book One Nation Under God. Ten things every Christian should know about the founding of America. Please let me warn you, they're trying to rewrite our history. And they're trying to get God out of it. Do you understand one half of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence were dead within 12 months for putting their name on the paper? 
If I put a paper down here and I said, I want you all to sign it, but half of you will be dead within a year for putting your name on that, what would have to be on that paper such that you'd line up to sign it? Why was it that every signer held the Bible? Ten things every Christian should know. Don't you let them steal God out of what God did in this country. And then ten things every Christian should know about the Constitution. Everywhere I go, people say, I believe in the Constitution. They've never read it. They have no idea what's in there. You say, well, I'd like to read it, but it would take a long time. If you're an average reader, you can easily read the U.S. Constitution in 15 minutes. You can put a copy in your shirt pocket. And they want to tell you the Bible had nothing to do with its writing, then why in the drafts are 90% of the reference notes to the Bible? The Bible had nothing to do. Every morning, and boy, I encourage this book. This is a ladies devotional. Now it's designed for ladies. It's full of pretty pictures and stuff. But every morning at 5 a.m., I know where I'll find my wife every morning. She's at the kitchen table handwriting prayers for our kids. She's done it every morning since she found she was pregnant with our oldest child. And I always ask her, honey, why do you write them? She said, because the devil's after my kids and I'm their mom. At the end of the week, she tears them all up, throws them away, starts over. I said, we should put some of these in a devotional. And she said, who'd read me? I'm a nobody. I said, you're the best heart I know. This is the third one. We have never had anything get the response that this has. Now, it's designed for women. We have men reading. In fact, we have some pastors taking their men through it. Uh, Pastor Chapel uh, said, I'm using some of your wife's stuff with my men. I'm just not telling them where I got it. <laughs> it was cute. This would be a great thing to take home to your wife. And then there's a children's book there that my wife did years ago. She created a little fictitious frog called Georgie. She wanted the kids to memorize scripture, our kids. So she would take a Bible verse, have them memorize it, and then would tell them a little fictitious Georgie story. And these stories got a life of their own. And one day, uh, Dr. Jack Treber from California heard my wife telling a joke. He said, where'd you get those? She said, oh, I made them up years ago. He said, well, would you put them in print so I could use them with my grandkids? Remember, what your grandkids or your little kids get when they're young, they will carry the rest of their life. They'll never forget it. This is back there. Now, here's our policy. If you're here and you have no money, I'll give you a book if you just promise me you'll read it. But please don't fib to me about whether you have money or not. How many of you all agree it's not nice to fib to Brother Gibbs? How many of you all agree with that? Praise the Lord. Please, once again, get Brother Vaughn's book. Brother Getch's books, uh, that one on the mind. Oh, I encourage that. I've given many copies of that away. There's a few books I've read multiple times. That's one of them. The thing that he has in there on the invited friend to your house is worth the price of the book in itself. You make sure you get these resources. Remember, in this world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. The devil's scared to death of the smile in your heart. And if there's a smile in your heart, there'll be a smile on your face. Thank you, Brother Vaughn.